I've been asked to introduce Simon, um, and actually, when you get asked to introduce people, you're always like, oh, this is really tough. But actually, I was delighted to be able to introduce Simon because uh, he's very easy to introduce, and maybe a man who needs no introduction. So uh, I have a very brief bio, but hopefully he's going to set some interesting context for what we're um, going to be do, doing for the rest of the day. So um, Professor Simon Payton jones he's a principal researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge, um, previously uh, at Cambridge at UCL and a prof at Glasgow. Um, his major kind of work has been functional programming, Haskell and the Glasgow Haskell compiler. So obviously, Have you heard of Haskell? good, yes, fantastic. Well, well done. Yeah, ni niche is a is a niche audience. Is a niche audience. Uh, however, uh, I suppose, however, the kind of significant contributions, as we've it's been alluded to, has has been his his role as as chair of computing at school, so CAS within the UK. So. Um, Simon has, without doubt, been the driving force behind CAS since its inception in 2008, and you know it's very, it's, it's not over exaggerating his contributions to say um, the change of curriculum within England and also the broader national and international focus on computer science education has been down to Simon's tireless work, and that's been in partnership with loads of other people and organisations. But he has certainly been the man who has been put in front of ministers, who has, has kind of worked with industry and actually engaging all the key stakeholders to make this happen. So um, he is a fellow of the BCS, which is a fantastic achievement. He's a fellow of the ACM, uh, and, and more recently he has been made a fellow of the Royal Society. So it's a, um, that is an, indeed a significant achievement. So um, Simon's going to talk broadly across the themes that have been discussed today, and um, hopefully you can give some insight for our discussions this afternoon. So I'll hand over to Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a uh, pleasure and a privilege to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity to um, address such a senior and exalted part of BCS. I have been a BCS member since I graduated in 1980. So I am a, 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 probably uh, it's a fairly, fairly long-standing BCS member by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm going to, what I would like to do is to just take you very quickly through um, uh, some, some of the events of the last few years and, and then lead up to a dialogue about BCS's involvement and how we might develop that further. So um, please do uh, sort of ask questions and make comments as we go along. We got, uh, we're going to finish in 45 minutes, come what may, right? My plan is to go fairly fast to begin with because I think some of it will be fairly, and then sort of slow down, okay? But, but please, let's have a dialogue as we go rather than sitting very politely uh, like you know in a respectful way that would be bad I would dislike that um, so let's start here this is the new program of study launched September 2014 for computing and it says this is and this covers ages 6 through to 16 and it says that every child can understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science including logic algorithms data representation and communication and that every child can analyze problems in computational terms and have repeated practical programming experience of solving those, those problems those those are pretty clear and radical statements to have as part of a national curriculum from age six. Um, so the, in, in what I want to do today is just to say a little bit about positioning, you know, how this came to be and, and why this might even be a sensible thing to do, um, and then to speak a little bit about how BCS has been involved and where we might go from here. Um, so just starting from the first of those, what is it we're trying to achieve in educational terms here? I'm just going to rehearse the story very quickly with you. Some of you will be familiar with it, but others, it may helpful, may be helpful just to uh, tell the story the way that I've been telling it to you know, ministers and senior, senior school leaders and others, because it may help you to, uh, to, in, to in turn uh, do the megaphone effect, whereas our earlier speaker about um, conveying it to other people. Here is a quote I really like about education. It's to prepare young people for um, jobs that don't exist using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems of which we are not yet aware, right? That's a nice, ambitious story for what we're trying to do in education, right? And to do that, at school we typically teach something about skills and something about discipline. So my skills, I mean things like um, uh, con typically concerned with artifacts, how to use devices or tools, bandsaws or um, uh, textiles, work sewing machines, or indeed computer programs. And by disciplines, I mean um, things with a body of knowledge, um, and, uh, you know, just facts that you might know and principles and theorems and things that are always true. Uh, that, um, and you might think of uh, science, um, natural science, mathematics and history um, and geography in these ways. And these, are, these, are, these subject disciplines teach our children things, well, and indeed us in the past, stuff that will last our whole lifetimes, that will survive successive ways of technology, whereas the stuff on the right is more inherently technologically focused. D does that make sense? And so kind of both are important. We don't want to get the two out of balance. And indeed, 
teach schools typically do teach both, but what had happened in computing is we had somehow sleepwalked our way into, and we won't go into why, into a situation in which really the skills side was dominant. Until 2010, certainly, I, there was an established school subject called Information and Communication Technology, which had many good things about it, but in its very title, you can see that it was focused on technology. Right? It was a technology subject, and at its worst, and not every school was at its worst, but it was too common, it was no more than teaching children how to use Microsoft Word, which initially they um, might not have known, but increasingly they already did, so that the whole thing had sort of spiralled into a kind of death spiral, and that was really where CAS started. So, um, and what, what about the discipline part? Well, we never really had it at school, right, because... Um, uh, never really recognised that computer science wasn't recognised as a subject discipline until um, uh, until uh, in a, at university. When I was at university, 1976 to 80, there was not a three-year uni uh, University of Cambridge computer science degrees d degree. You know, Cambridge takes a little while to catch up with these things. They have now got one, um, but even recognising computer science as a subject discipline in the way that you would think of maths or natural science as subject discipline really hadn't didn't happen until the sort of 70s and 80s at all. So it's not surprising that it really hadn't at school. So our diagnosis of what had gone wrong here is we become too focused on technology and not enough on ideas, right? And so what are we to do about that? Well, we want to, I mean, well, there's sort of technology versus ideas, but there are other ways to state this, that we would like, um, we are too much focused on reading rather than writing, on consuming rather than creating, right? And on using rather than understanding. And, I, and this last line is just a little reference to Arthur C. Clarke, who said, any form of technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And it really is damaging if our children come to believe that the sleek devices that they use that are on all our tables here are essentially magic that is made by people somewhere else over whom they have you know no control and they don't have control of their devices because they're made somewhere else they're in effect they're like spells and if you in, in you know make the right incantations good things will happen and if you don't then they won't and that's you know, that's about it for magic does that make sense so that was the, that's the sort of diagnosis for, for, for what, went, what, 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 what the trouble was. So if we're then going to say that a way to fix this might be to have some of the subject discipline at school level, we start to have to say, what might that look like? And rather than give you words, I'm going to give you pictures. I'm going to give you a couple of pictures that I've found go over rather well, just by way of concrete illustration, to just concretely illustrate what's um, incarnate, what we have in mind. This is sorting, right? So here are some students, primary school students. They're walking over a network that's drawn on the ground. When when two students approach one of these circles, um, if the, it's actually a square here, the two is bigger than the six, the two is smaller than the six, so they swap places. If it, if it wasn't smaller, they wouldn't swap places. And they, they do this at, um, all at the same time. So in, in pairs they meet, they meet, they swap or don't swap, they follow the lines. It is an algorithm. It is actually a parallel algorithm being executed by primary school children. And when they get to the end, lo, they are sorted. And even Michael Gove laughs when he sees that. There's clearly something intriguing going on. You can um, do this with uh, you know, funny numbers. You can do it on a larger scale. Tim Bell, who made this video, tells me it took him a whole morning to record this 10 seconds of video because it takes a lot of marshalling to get children to do this. Now, why did I show you this? Well, so clearly this is not about technology. Why is it not? It clearly isn't about technology because there is no technology in sight. So it's a wonderfully clear way of saying it's, a, it's not about technology, it's about ideas. Clearly, too, there are some interesting ideas going on here. How is it that this sorting network does it? Does it always work? And it's an idea that you can explore in an experimental way. A child can say, maybe the teacher put us in the right order so we come out sorted. Let's fool the teacher and mess ourselves up at the beginning. But lo, every input combination ends up sorted. They can do that experimentally. They could ask the question, could you have fewer boxes and arrows? Could you connect them up in different ways? Would that work? And some of these questions are quite deep, but I love the way that even a 10-year-old can ask and experiment with answers to questions like that. Does that make sense? I'm trying try to get a visceral sense for what this kind of uh, computer science as a, as a you know, primary school subject might look like. So here's another one, which I, uh, um, Bill is uh, fond of. And um, this is to do, because you were talking about crossover into other subjects, this is about English, actually. So this is a sentence generator. The rules are you put your finger on the, the diagram, and when you, you can follow any arrow, but you must say the word. So the old clown laughed and uh, a tiny pirate and the big clown sang and you come out so it's a 
It's a sentence generator, right? And it's not long after you show children uh, this kind of diagram. They start writing their own diagrams to generate sentences, usually rude ones. Um, they, uh, in fact, it's not long before they start reverse engineering the laws of English grammar because they start to be more ambitious in the sentences that they want to do. So, and of course, you know, you and I know that this is just a finite state machine and the very same diagrams you could use to describe the behavior of that incomprehensible microwave oven you have. So it's a sort of common pattern that we use to um, you know, explain many, you know, things that range from the grammar of the English language to how a microwave oven works. Does that make sense? But again, something that can be embodied in a very incarnated, visceral way um, that, that children might make sense of and might be sort of, uh, have some relevance to their lives. Okay? So that's the... I'm not really going to say any, any, any more about what the, the sort of... The, you know, the, what the subject discipline is, Cass has done quite a lot on this. I just want to um, spend a moment on, j just on, on essentially positioning, right? What is the overall vision we're try we've been trying to articulate? And here it is, um, which a couple of speakers already mentioned this morning, computer science is a foundational discipline that like other foundational subject disciplines, every child should have the opportunity to learn from primary school onwards. Right? And this is a very close connection with this kind of making IT good for society slogan for the, the BCS. Right? This is a societal kind of vision. I want to say, um, I've already talked about this third point, ideas about not technology, and there's a, you know, Dijkstra's famous quote about um, computing. He said, computing is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. That's a nice quote. Um, and uh, it has some, some resonance. But I want to say a little bit more about these, these other three things. Why every child? If we're going to speak about computing for every child, this is a, then we, we have to, it's, it's not enough to say, because we need software engineers. Because most children in primary school are not going to become software engineers. They're going to become hairdressers and plumbers and brain surgeons. Um, right? So what about them? Well, so you have to sort of ask a bit about why... Um, I might want every child to learn something about computing. So, and I find that a helpful way to think about this is why do we believe that every child should learn some natural science? Right? Why at primary school do we send children off to the pond to collect tadpoles uh, and roll balls down inclined? I don't know whether they do that at primary school, but so, you know, some physics, some chemistry. Why do we do that? Because, it, because it's kind of relevant to them because, it, because it's something to do with the world that surrounds them. Right? Um, and almost everybody will come back in the end, after they thought about it for 30 seconds, they'll say, it's because we want our children to understand something about, to understand something about the natural world that surrounds them so that they can have agency in it, right? If you uh, switch on a light switch, is it magic that the light goes on? I mean, you don't need to know why it works to know that the light switch will put it on, but it's really helpful. Some, something deep in us says it's important to know that it isn't magic. The electricity flows along wires, that some wires are high voltage and some are low voltage. That the electricity doesn't arrive by magic in your house. It comes from a power station which burns fuel, which might cause global warming. All of that stuff is part of our sort of base load stuff that we know. We take it for granted so much. We don't have, children don't have that for computing. They just have the sleek surface. Okay, so that's, I think this, this is important because it's part of the sort of fundamental justification of why we would want to teach computing or computer science, and it's a subject discipline, to every child, including at primary school, because that is a seismic change in what we're doing educationally. These other two points here are kind of important as well. I think it's not just the built world, right, the digital world that we have constructed. We've increasingly understanding the natural world in computational terms. My colleagues at Microsoft Research are studying, you know, cell biology and beginning to write programs that turn into, you know, DNA sequences that, and which the, the cell is the execution engine for the programs that they're writing. Or if you see the way that animals organize themselves, termites organize themselves to build mounds, that's a computational process going on. And we can think about it in computational terms and increasingly scientists are. Um, and of course, you know, you can get skills for almost any job, right, through computing. Now, everybody claims that. Latin claims that. French claims that, right, that you learn useful thinking skills. But in the case of computer science, it's really true. Um, <laughs> uh, so, this is uh, about every child, right? Um, second thing I just want to point out here is that it's an educational story, not an instrumental one. By instrumental, I mean that previously, really people had only really thought of computing in terms of pictures like this, like how many, you know, uh, software developers do we need in our, and what's the demand for people coming out of the educational pipeline? Now, this is important, make no mistake. It's a fantastic win to be able to say to a child, actually, this will get you any number of highly paid jobs. That's very attractive. And there'll be exciting and creative jobs. But it, it kind of, and it, it's very 
very useful as a, as a companion argument, but not as the only one. And I think previously we'd really emphasized this too much. But it is fantastic, right? There is a huge demand, um, and we really do need to start feeding it. But it's uh, um, feeding both, both at the same time is really very important to making the case, I think. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that it's, uh, it's about a discipline, not a skill. You will have seen a lot of these. Why our kids must learn to code. Why all our children teach your kids to code. Teaching our children code, the quiet revolution. If you ask a man in the street who's heard about the change in the national curriculum, they would probably say it's about teaching our kids to code, isn't it? Right? But it isn't. That would just be to unhook our children from one pile of technology, namely Microsoft Office, and hook them onto a different pile of technology, namely Java programming. Right? And that would do them as great a disservice, well, maybe slightly, slightly less great disservice, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't articulate, it wouldn't embody the vision that I've just described to you. Okay? So there we are. That's my so sort of um, end of my kind of, th this is the, uh, positioning for what we're seeking to achieve, the grand vision, if you like, for what we're trying to achieve. Now, um, so, so much for that. Uh, uh, I just want to spend uh, um, the next uh, um, three or four minutes explaining how we got from you know, a vision like that to a change in policy. And here's how it went. Um, 2008, we formed CAS. There were four of us at that stage in a room at Microsoft Research. Um, and we really felt that, the, you know, that we were like you know, at the bottom of a deep mine shaft, very, very within, within an, a system with a huge inertia that we were most unlikely to change. But we thought we should, you know, it was a kind of good cause. We should try to do it anyway. One of the first things that we did after we spent some while well, getting ourselves organized was just to write a curriculum to try to articulate what it was that we thought should be taught in school computing. So we wrote this. This is about 35 pages long. It was try we were trying to write, we wrote it with teachers, and we tried very hard to write it in language that teachers would understand, um, and to make sense as, a, you know, of something, that, this is what computer science thought of as a school subject, rather than as a university subject, might look like. Um, and at that stage, we had no customers for this, it was just something that we did to keep ourselves honest. Then, there was a series of um, kind of breakthroughs that were, we, we were sort of very fortunate to participate in. Uh, firstly, there was a change of government, and then Michael Gove, the uh, Secretary of State for Education, instituted a review of the whole national curriculum. So suddenly that meant that there was motion in the system, right? Changing one subject is hard. If everything's changing, there's more, you know, there's, there's more opportunity. When everything's changing, you can, uh, it's easier to get your particular bit to uh, crystallize in a new way. This was very influential. Eric Schmidt gave a famous talk, many of you will um, come across it, in which he said just a few sentences, about three sentences in a long speech, but three sentences in the speech of a very visible um, industry leader can be incredibly influential. In our case, it moved the debate from an educational ghetto question to something that David Cameron was interested in. It moved it sort of up. David Cameron was soon after heard saying, Eric Schmidt is right, we should teach our kids to code. You know, he wasn't quite on message, but um, it was close, <laughs> right? The Royal Society got involved and wrote this report, which many of you have seen as well. Um, this is, um, uh, was a very uh, influential report that said essentially everything that I've just described, right? But it came from, instead of coming from this upstart organization, you know, of guerrilla uh, fighters, you know, a few hundred people, it came from the Royal Society, which had been around for 400 years. Guess which the government listens to? Why did the Royal Society write it? It was because some fellows of the Royal Society said, these CAS guys are onto something. We should see how the Royal Society could help. A thing we could do would be to get the Royal Society to write a report, and that's how it happened. So I think, again, with, it was fantastically helpful, the Royal Society, but without CAS, would not have happened, I believe. Um, let's see. So then, uh, by now, I'll say more about the uh, connection with BCS, but, but, but later in the, the, the um, national curriculum, the Department for Education actually outsourced writing the new curriculum. For everything else, they wrote them with their internal experts. But, but in, in the case of computing, they said, OK, you, BCS, specifically you, Bill Mitchell, and it was the Royal Academy of Engineering, I think it was a collaborative thing, please go away, form a group of stakeholders across the piece, and write a new national curriculum for computing for age 6 through to 16, no more than two sides of A4, please. That was the spec. Um, then, uh, I, so I got asked to chair that group, and it was a pretty exciting process, but uh, we published it a year later, and a year after that, it was, it was actually, the government did not mess with it very much, right? So it, really, so it was a, it was, in effect, we got almost everything that we asked for. It's completely astonishing. Nobody was more astonished than us that we, you know, we were sort of hoping for X, and we more or less got X. A bit scary, actually, when somebody puts you on the other side and says, all right, you steer the ship, where should we go? So that's a very accelerated history of, of how this happened. But it was a, a movement from 
a tiny guerrilla organization into a group that the government turned to for advice, and it sort of flips almost imperceptibly but instantaneously somewhere in the middle. Very strange process, rather an exciting one to be part of.